Welcome to Windy Night Stories. Tonight's story is by Shirley Jackson, The Beautiful Stranger. What might be called the first intimation of strangeness occurred at the railroad station. She had come with her children, small John and her baby girl, to meet her husband when he returned from a business trip to Boston. Because she had been oddly afraid of being late, and perhaps even seeming uneager to encounter her husband after a week's separation, she dressed the children and put them into the car at home a long half hour before the train was due. As a result, of course, they had to wait interminably long at the station, and what was to have been a charmingly staged reunion, family embracing husband and father, became at last an ill-timed and awkward performance. Small John's hair was mussed, and he was sticky. The baby was cross, pulling at her pink bonnet and her dainty lace-edged dress, whining. The final arrival of the train caught them in mid-movement, as it were. Margaret was tying the ribbons on the baby's bonnet. Small John was half over the back of the car seat. They scrambled out of the car, cringing from the sound of the train, hopelessly out of sorts. John Sr. waved from the high steps of the train. Unlike his wife and children, he looked utterly prepared for his return, as though he had taken some pains to secure a meeting at least painless, and had, in fact, stood just so, waving cordially from the steps of the train for perhaps as long as half an hour, ensuring that he should not be caught half ready, his hand not lifted so far as to overemphasize the extent of his delight in seeing them again. His wife had an odd sense of lost time. Standing now on the platform with the baby in her arms and small John beside her, she could not for a minute remember clearly whether he was coming home or whether they were yet standing here to say goodbye to him. They had been quarreling when he left, and she had spent the week of his absence determining to forget that in his presence she had been frightened and hurt. This will be a good time to get things straight, she had been telling herself. While John is gone, I can try to get a hold of myself again. Now, unsure at last whether this was an arrival or a departure, she felt afraid again, straining to meet an unendurable tension. This will not do, she thought, believing that she was being honest with herself, and as he came down the train steps and walked toward them, she smiled, holding the baby tightly against her, so that the touch of its small warmth might bring some genuine tenderness to her smile. This will not do, she thought, and smiled more cordially and told him hello as he came to her. Wondering, she kissed him, and then when he held his arm around her and the baby for a minute, the baby pulled back and struggled, screaming. Everyone moved in anger, and the baby kicked and screamed, No, no, no. What a way to say hello to Daddy, Margaret said, and she shook the baby, half amused, and yet grateful for the baby's sympathetic support. John turned to Small John and lifted him, Small John kicking and laughing helplessly. Daddy, Daddy, Small John shouted, and the baby screamed, No, no. Helplessly, because no one could talk with the baby screaming so, they turned and went to the car. When the baby was back in her pink basket in the car, and Small John was settled with another lollipop beside her, there was an appalling quiet which would have to be filled as quickly as possible with meaningful words. John had taken the driver's seat in the car while Margaret was quieting the baby, and when Margaret got in beside him, she felt a little chill of animosity at the sight of his hands on the wheel. I can't bear to relinquish even this much, she thought. For a week no one has driven the car but me, because she could so clearly see that this was unreasonable. John owned half the car, after all. She said to him with bright interest, And how was your trip? The weather? Wonderful, he said, and again she was angered at the warmth in his tone. If she was unreasonable about the car, he was surely unreasonable to have enjoyed himself quite so much. Everything went well. I'm pretty sure I got the contract. Everyone was very pleasant about it, and I go back in two weeks to settle everything. The stinger is in the tail, she thought. He wouldn't tell it all so hastily if he didn't want me to miss half of it. I am supposed to be pleased that he got the contract and that everybody was so pleasant, and the part about going back is supposed to slip past me painlessly. Maybe I can go with you then, she said. Your mother will take the children. Fine, he said, but it was much too late. He had hesitated noticeably before he spoke. I want to go too, said Small John. Can I go with Daddy? They came into their house, Margaret carrying the baby, and John carrying his suitcase and arguing delightedly with Small John over which of them was carrying the heavier weight of it. The house was ready for them. 
Margaret had made sure that it was cleaned and emptied of all the qualities which attached so surely to her position of wife alone with small children. The toys which Small John had thrown around with unusual freedom were picked up. The baby's clothes, no one after all came to call when John was gone, were taken from the kitchen radiator where they had been drying. Aside from the fact that the house gave no impression of waiting for any particular people, but only for someone well-bred and clean enough to fit within its small, trim walls, it could have passed for a home, Margaret thought, even for a home where a happy family lived in domestic peace. She set the baby down in the playpen and turned with the baby's bonnet and jacket in her hand and saw her husband, head bent gravely as he listened to Small John. Who, she wondered suddenly, is he taller? That is not my husband. She laughed, and they turned to her, Small John curious, and her husband with a quick, bright recognition. She thought, why, it is not my husband, and he knows that I have seen it. There was no astonishment in her. She would have thought perhaps thirty seconds before that such a thing was impossible. But since it was now clearly possible, surprise would have been meaningless. Some other emotion was necessary, but she found at first only peripheral manifestations of one. Her heart was beating violently, her hands were shaking, and her fingers were cold. Her legs felt weak, and she took hold of the back of a chair to steady herself. She found that she was still laughing, and then her emotion caught up with her, and she knew what it was. It was relief. I'm glad you came, she said. She went over and put her head against his shoulder. It was hard to say hello in the station, she said. Small John looked on for a moment, then wandered off to his toy box. Margaret was thinking, this is not the man who enjoyed seeing me cry. I need not be afraid. She caught her breath and was quiet. There was nothing that needed saying. For the rest of the day she was happy. There was a constant delight and a relief from the weight of her fear and unhappiness. It was pure joy to know that there was no longer any residue of suspicion of hatred. When she called him John, she did so demurely, knowing that he participated in her secret amusement. When he answered her civilly, there was, she thought, an edge of laughter behind his words. They seemed to have agreed soberly that mention of the subject would be in bad taste, might even, in fact, endanger their pleasure. They were hilarious at dinner. John would not have made her a cocktail. But when she came downstairs from putting the children to bed, the stranger met her at the foot of the stairs, smiling up at her, and took her arm to lead her into the living room, where the cocktail shaker and glasses stood on the low table beside the fire. How nice, she said, happy that she had taken a moment to brush her hair and put on fresh lipstick, happy that the coffee table which she had chosen with John and the fireplace which had seen many fires built by John, and the low sofa where John had slept sometimes, had all seen fit to welcome the stranger with grace. She sat on the sofa and smiled at him when he handed her the glass. There was an odd, illicit excitement in all of it. She was entertaining a man. The scene was a little marred by the fact that he had given her a martini with neither olive nor onion. It was the way she preferred her martini, and yet he should not have strictly known this. But she reassured herself with the thought that naturally he would have taken some pains to inform himself before coming. He lifted his glass to her with a smile. He is here only because I am here, she thought. It's nice to be here, he said. He had, then, made one attempt to sound like John in the car coming home. After he knew that she had recognized him for a stranger, he had never made any attempt to say words like coming home or getting back, and of course she could not, not without pointing her lie. She put her hand on his and lay back against the sofa, looking into the fire. Being lonely is worse than anything in the world, she said. You're not lonely now. Are you going away? Not unless you come too. They laughed at his parody of John. They sat next to each other at dinner. She and John had always sat at formal opposite ends of the table, asking one another politely to pass the salt and the butter. I'm going to put a little set of shelves over there, he said, nodding toward the corner of the dining room. It looks empty here, and it needs things, symbols. She liked to look at him. His hair, she thought, was a little darker than John's, and his hands were stronger. This man would build whatever he decided he wanted built. We need things together, things we like, both of us. Small, delicate, pretty things. Ivory. With John, she would have felt it necessary to remark at once that they could not afford such delicate, pretty things, and put a cold finish to the idea, 
But with the stranger, she said, we'd have to look for them. Not everything would be right. I saw a little creature once, he said, like a tiny little man, only colored all purple and blue and gold. She remembered this conversation. It contained the truth like a jewel set in the evening. Much later, she was to tell herself that it was true. John could not have said these things. She was happy. She was radiant. She had no conscience. He went obediently to his office the next morning, saying goodbye at the door with a rueful smile that seemed to mock the present necessity for doing things that John always did. And as she watched him go down the walk, she reflected that this was surely not going to be permanent. She could not endure having him gone for so long every day, although she had felt little about parting from John. Moreover, if he kept doing John's things, he might grow imperceptibly more like John. We will simply have to go away, she thought. She was pleased seeing him get into the car. She would gladly share with him, indeed give him outright, all that had been John's, so long as he stayed her stranger. She laughed while she did her homework and dressed the baby. She took satisfaction in unpacking his suitcase, which he had abandoned and forgotten in a corner of the bedroom, as though prepared to take it up and leave again if she had not been as he thought her, had not wanted him to stay. She put away his clothes, so disarmingly like John's, and wondered for a moment at the closet. Would there be a kind of delicacy in him about John's things? Not so long as he began with John's wife and laughed again. The baby was cross all day, but when small John came home from nursery school, his first question was, looking up eagerly, where is Daddy? Daddy has gone to the office, and again she laughed, at the moment's quick, sly picture of the insult to John. Half a dozen times during the day she went upstairs to look at his suitcase and touch the leather softly. She glanced constantly as she passed through the dining room into the corner where the small shelves would be some day, and told herself that they would find a tiny little man, all purple and blue and gold, to stand on the shelves and guard them from intrusion. When the children awakened from their naps, she took them for a walk and then, away from the house and returned violently to her former lonely pattern, walk with the children, talk meaninglessly of Daddy, long for someone to talk to in the evening ahead, restrain herself from hurrying home, he might have telephoned. She began to feel frightened again. Suppose she had been wrong. It could not be possible that she was mistaken. It would be unutterly cruel for John to come home tonight. Then she heard the car stop, and when she opened the door and looked up, she thought, no, it is not my husband, with a return of gladness. She was aware from his smile that he had perceived her doubts, and yet he was so clearly a stranger that, seeing him, she had no need of speaking. She asked him, instead, almost meaningless questions during that evening, and his answers were important only because she was storing them away to reassure herself while he was away. She asked him what was the name of their Shakespeare professor in college, and who was that girl he liked so much before he met Margaret. When he smiled and said that he had no idea, that he would not recognize the name if she told him, she was in delight. He had not bothered to master all of the past, then. He had learned enough, the names of the children, the location of the house, how she liked her cocktails, to get to her, and after that it was not important, because either she would want him to stay, or she would, calling upon John, send him away again. What is your favorite food? she asked him. Are you fond of fishing? Did you ever have a dog? Someone told me today, he said once, that he had heard I was back from Boston, and I distinctly thought he said that he heard I was dead in Boston. He was lonely too, she thought with sadness, and that is why he came, bringing a destiny with him. Now I will see him come home every evening through the door and think, this is not my husband, and wait for him remembering that I am waiting for a stranger. At any rate, she said, you were not dead in Boston, and nothing else matters. She saw him leave in the morning with a warm pride, and she did her housework and dressed the baby. When small John came home from nursery school, he did not ask, but looked with quick searching eyes and then sighed. While the children were taking their naps, she thought she might take them to the park this afternoon, and then the thought of another such afternoon, long afternoon with no one but the children, another afternoon of widowhood, was more than she could submit to. I have done this too much, she thought. I must see something today beyond the faces of my children. No one should be so much alone. Moving quickly, she dressed and set the house to rights. She called a high school girl and asked if she would take the children to the park. Without guilt, she neglected the thousand small orders regarding the proper jacket for the baby, 
whether small John might have popcorn, when to bring them home. She fled, thinking, I must be with people. She wandered through the strange shops in the town, choosing small, lovely items to stand on the new shelves, looking long and critically at ivories, at small statues, at brightly colored, meaningless, expensive toys, suitable for giving to a stranger. It was almost dark when she started home, carrying her packages. She looked from the window of the taxi into the dark streets, and thought with pleasure that the stranger would be home before her, and looked from the window to see her hurrying to him. He would think, this is a stranger. I am waiting for a stranger, as he saw her coming. Here, she said, tapping on the glass. Right here, driver. She got out of the taxi and paid the driver, and smiled as he drove away. I must look well, she thought. The driver smiled back at me. She turned and started for the house, and then hesitated. Surely she had come too far? This is not possible, she thought. This cannot be. Surely our house was white? The evening was very dark, and she could see only the houses going in rows, with more rows beyond them, and more rows beyond that. And somewhere a house which was hers, with the beautiful stranger inside, and she lost out here. The End